Welcome back to another one of your flipped lectures. Today we're going to talk about economic changes in the modern U.S. But kind of before we start talking about the actual history, let's kind of go through a couple of definitions in economics. When we talk about industrialization, what we're talking about is the development of factories and manufacturing, the development of a wide transportation network, steam trains, steam boats, and the Intercontinental Railroad. What we're also talking about is the increase in the number of available products and the amount of products. And in general, kind of just a higher level of productivity due to the use of machines. What all this results in is a higher standard of living and an increased total wealth in the United States. And also what industrialization means is the country is going to begin to move from a more rural kind of farming type of a mentality to a more urban mentality. And when we talk about kind of the making of an economic boom, kind of why the United States is going to take off so quickly, we look at kind of a couple of the things that you need. Natural resources are something that you need in order to basically have a manufacturing economy, right? You need resources to make things out of. And with that, kind of with the geographic expansion of the United States, they're going to have all the things they need to industrialize. Immigration is going to increase the labor force exponentially, which is going to contribute because the supply of labor is going to keep up with the demand. Also during this time, there's a heavy amount of inventions and machinery that are going to basically contribute to the growth of businesses happening very, very fast. We also kind of had some social inventions and ways of organizing our economic life, the way that people buy and sell things, as well as the way people work, that are really going to kind of contribute to this massive boom in the wealth of the United States. And kind of this period in history is characterized by the increase in the collection of natural resources in the United States. And these natural resources, being in the United States, matter. Because it means that you don't have to trade or import all the resources you need for production. Most of it you can find inside the United States and you can get it for a reasonable price. In the West, precious metals were discovered. Gold, copper, silver, iron. And in the Eastern States, you have coal mines in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. You have oil being discovered, iron, timber. In short, kind of everything that you need to begin a manufacturing economy. Then there were some rather large inventions that came to be during this time. In terms of steel, the Bessemer process is a process that made making large quantities of steel very, very cost effective. And you need steel in order to make the skyscrapers and the heavy machinery necessary for um, kind of this expansion. And so steel is going to be a huge factor in why industrialization takes the United States by storm. Also, machines in general are going to increase productivity and they are going to lower costs. In manufacturing, in farming, new technology is going to increase productivity. Mining, chemical creation, almost any industry you can think of, new technologies is going to lower costs by doing kind of a lot of the processes that used to have to be done by hand via machine. Also, communication and transportation technology is going to connect the country like never before and is going to create a national system basically where companies can exist and be national companies selling their products all over the country. And we talk about businesses being created. Oftentimes, you might hear people refer to the idea of business climate. And the business climate at any given time is a good indicator of kind of whether the economy is going to grow and, or not, and also at what rate it's going to grow. And what the business climate is, it's the economic environment that's comprised of a number of parts, comprised of the government, lending institutions, um, the labor market, tax rates, and inflation rates. So let's break down that definition just a little bit. Firstly, when we talk about the attitude of government towards businesses, we have to realize that government can affect business in a number of ways. Firstly, governments set tax rates on businesses, which is going to basically determine how much of their profits they're going to keep and how much they're going to be able to reinvest. And so if tax rates on businesses are low, you tend to see kind of larger, larger economic growth in certain situations. Also, legal changes, such as rules and regulations, is going to affect the way businesses operate. The laws set by the government affect business contracts. They also health and safety regulations affect kind of how businesses can operate and how employees are dealt with. 
and also rules about wages or um, accessibility or other things can really affect kind of the cost of doing business or kind of how a company has to do business. A good example of this is minimum wage. Kind of other good examples um, are like pollution laws, um, health and safety codes for workers in factories, and things of that nature. And so the government also controls the idea of inflation, right? The idea of what the dollar is worth. And government controls the money supply. And so in doing so, they determine kind of what a dollar is worth, and that can have a big effect on businesses. But on the whole, kind of the role of government is always to kind of balance the need to kind of give businesses some freedom to expand and do things, coupled with the idea that business left unrestrained might get a little bit out of hand, as we'll kind of talk about with reform movements after kind of this industrialization. A second very important part of the business climate is the attitude of lending institutions and investors. And when we talk about entrepreneurs, we're talking about the people who are starting owning and running their own businesses. Typically, people who are entrepreneurs risk their own money. And typically, they start out with kind of a very small business and try to grow it. But in order to grow a business, you need capital. You need either cash, um, machines, assets, materials. You need something that is basically going to help your business start and be able to grow. And businesses can get that capital in any number of ways. And the most kind of common form of capital is money that is going to be spent on the business. So a few ways businesses can get that money. They can either sell stock, which is part ownership in the country, to people in basically a stock market. And then they collect the money that people are willing to pay for those um, shares of the company. Also, there are lending institutions, which can provide capital as loans to be paid back. Banks, finance companies, and others will lend you money to start a business, but then you have to pay back that loan with interests. Also, investors can choose to risk capital in exchange for some equity, part ownership, a percentage of a company. And risk means that you invest money with the chance that the money is going to be lost. And so, kind of, capitalism is about risk. You start a business and you're not sure whether or not it's going to be successful or not. And so the amount of capital that investors and lenders are willing to risk or loan is going to affect the creation of expansion in businesses. If people think there's a good chance they'll get their money paid back, they'll lend more. If they think that the business climate is uncertain, basically they will lend less, and that will have a huge impact on the growth and creation of businesses. And probably the most famous um, kind of place to invest is known as the stock market. And what a stock is, is it is a share. It is a piece of a company. And a share, owning a share of a stock, actually makes you a part owner. So if you bought a share of Coca-Cola, then you would be a part owner of Coca-Cola. And if you own a share, you are entitled to dividends, where basically they take all the profits and they divide them out by the number of shares that basically they sold. So you get a share of the profits that your shares are going to entitle you to. And the stock market is a place where people and businesses can buy and sell these shares of stocks to other people. So you can also buy a stock at a company, not from the company, but from somebody else who owns a share. And what the stock market really does, it allows for more people and institutions to invest. Because you can invest $50, you can invest $100, $1,000, a $1 million dollars, and so it opens up kind of investing to a wide range of people. And so companies can sell their stock in the stock market to raise capital. And then the people who buy those stocks will then basically trade them between each other. Another essential piece of the business climate is the labor market. And labor, when we talk about labor, we're talking about the workforce in a particular area in kind of all of its, in kind of all of its diversity. The labor market's made up of two parts. It's made up of the number of jobs available, the supply of jobs, and which is basically the demand for workers. But on the other side, it's also made up of the supply of workers and their demand for jobs. And so kind of the principles of supply and demand that we talked about kind of raising or lowering the price of a cookie can also raise and lower wages, the amount that basically you're going to be paid. And a labor market can affect the economy in a number of ways. First off, the labor market, the supply of jobs versus kind of the supply of workers, is going to determine wages and benefits. 
and the amount that you have to pay your employees is going to end up being kind of the total cost of labor, which is going to affect the prices of your product. A good labor market can also allow for expansion because there are people available to kind of take those jobs. And a good labor market can also provide skilled workers, which is why we emphasize education so much at Cristo Rey and in the United States, is, also, is to provide skilled workers for the economy. And so another thing that has to do with government, but we should talk about in more detail, are tax rates. Governments collect taxes to pay for all the services and utilities that we have. Roads, police, the military, um, social programs, kind of anything you can imagine that government does, they pretty much collect taxes to pay for. Incomes tax and sales tax affect basically everyone. You have to pay money on basically your income, and then every time you buy something, in a lot of cases, you have to pay sales taxes, depending on where you are. And that affects the amount of money that people have to spend. Because if you pay more money in taxes, then you have less money in your pockets. And so businesses are taxed in a number of ways. They pay taxes on the property they own, um, taxes on their profits, taxes on dividends, taxes on um, the employee's wages. And so the rate of taxes can really affect businesses because if taxes are high, they might not, they might choose not to expand because it might be too expensive or choose not to hire. But on the other hand, if taxes are too low, then government won't be able to pay for all the services that we expect the government to provide. So there's really no kind of right answer to what the tax rate should be. So let's talk about the business climate during the early years of industrialization, I'm talking on 1870 forward, to kind of get a sense of why things are going to go the way they do. The government during this time had a policy called laissez-faire, which means let do or hands off. And laissez-faire policies are when the government puts very few rules and regulations on businesses. And when we talk about very few regulations during this time, we mean almost no regulations. Child labor is legal. There's really no health and safety laws. There's not really pollution laws. There's, very, there's no minimum wage. There's very few rules that are governing what businesses are doing. And so it allows them to create incredible profits, but it also creates some problems that we'll look at a little bit later. Also, there was low taxes. The attitude of this time, based on individualism, social Darwinism, is that the people should be able to choose how to spend their money and how to live their life, and basically not the government. That attitude will change in American history. We'll talk about the New Deal, progressivism, and how Americans kind of shift away from the laissez-faire attitude. During this time, capital was also very available. A lot of new lending institutions were created. The New York Stock Exchange, which you see a picture of, basically becomes a center where a lot of Americans can invest. And also, the expansion of wealth in general led to more money being available, and so people were willing to risk more capital in investment. Also, foreign countries like Great Britain saw a lot of opportunity, and they too invested in American industry. And so during this time, it was very easy to get capital to basically expand a business. Here's a little picture of the New York Stock Exchange from the year 1906. And the labor market during this time was characterized with a very large workforce. The immigration boom that we talked about earlier, kind of 23 million new immigrants, is going to provide 23 million new workers to fill the demand of the factories. There was also migration from farms to cities for other Americans that is all going to kind of contribute to a very large workforce being available. And because of that large workforce, and because much of it is unskilled labor, the cost of labor is very low in a lot of industries. Wages are extremely low, in many cases being about $1.50 a day. Work hours were often long, about 10 to 12 hours, six days a week was typical. Conditions were often unsafe, and there was also child labor. And the idea here is that businesses kept costs down, but it would create other problems among labor itself. Also, tax rates during this time are extremely low, and more profits meant more investment. However, be aware that there are no safety net programs provided by the government. There are no social welfare programs. There is, there's no food stamps. There's no social security. There is nothing if you fall on hard times that the government can basically provide for you. So that is kind of the trade-off of this time. 
And so when we talk about kind of how businesses change during this time, we got to talk about the rise of big business. And big business comes about as changes in economic life, the creation of the corporation, the consolidation of industries, and the invention of trusts and holding companies are basically going to change what is possible about owning a business, where it's now possible to own and operate a large billions, billion dollar enterprise fairly easily. And also technology is going to change what is possible with big business. The expansion of production means you can create millions of products. Expansion of the market means that you can sell those products almost anywhere. An economy of scale means that you can do all this for less money than if you just owned a small business. And here's how that idea of a big company being cheaper works. It's called economy of scale. And here's the equation. A large amount of product produced very fast equals efficiency and lower prices. And here's why. The goal of economy of scale is all about making your cost per unit low. And your and making your cost per unit low means producing as many products as possible with as little labor as possible. And in this sense, there are two kinds of costs for business when you talk about making a product. The first are fixed costs. And like it sounds, they're, they're a cost that is fixed. The company always has to pay even if the factory isn't running. Things like taxes, mortgages on buildings, as well as all of the expensive machinery that it takes to make all these products. Your operating costs are different. They're costs that only occur when your factory or whatever is running, when your business is operating. Things like wages for employees, materials that you make things out of, the shipping of the product, wherever you're going to sell it, those are operating costs. The bigger you get, the higher your fixed cost will be, but the lower your operating cost will be. Because you will have to invest a lot in a big machine. But in order to run that machine, to make products, that operating cost will be low because the wages will be less because you'll have fewer employees, materials will be cheaper, and things like that. And so if you are a big business, you by producing things on a large scale, you drive down your operating cost per unit, and that means that you can lower your costs well below smaller businesses that don't have kind of the large machinery to make these products, and you can drive that company out of business. And so again, economy of scale is all about cost per unit. And if you, keep your, if you keep your operating costs low, then the more product you make, the cheaper it will become. So now let's talk for a minute about the corporations, the imaginary friends who own most of the businesses. Before we talk about that, let's like review the stock market real quick. Remember, a stock is a piece of a company and it entitles you to dividends. Also, stocks can be bought and sold freely on the market for whatever price somebody will pay for it. So stocks go up and down in value, just like every other product, what people are willing to pay for it. But here's the purpose of a stock. The purpose of a stock is investment in the raising of capitals, but it's also to spread out risk, and it's also to limit your liability. And it also is to provide more liquidity of wealth. And what liquidity means is the idea that your wealth can very easily be turned from stocks into money or from property into money. And so stocks are very liquid because usually you can sell stocks really quickly without having to lower the price too much. But that idea of limited liability is important. That your liability, your risk, is only what you invest in. That even if a company goes under and is in debt, if you own a stock, they can own, basically, the worst thing that can happen to you is the value of your stock goes to zero. You cannot be sued personally, and you cannot have any of your assets taken. So let's talk about corporations for a second. Corporations are legal people who aren't real people. And here's how that works. A corporation is a legal invention. And it's been around for a long time. But in America, it becomes big during this time. And a corporation is a legal status. It allows a company or a group of people to act as one entity. Essentially, when you file the legal paperwork to create a corporation, you are creating a legal person on paper. So you're essentially creating an imaginary person who owns the business. This corporation has the legal status of one person. 
oftentimes individual shareholders of stock there are a large number of them so what this allows is for all those shareholders to own the business but none of them actually have to run the business the business is run by a board of directors and then basically the CEOs and the people who work for the company and the big thing with the corporation is that it protects the individual shareholders of stock their liability the amount that basically they are responsible for um, the debts or any like legal um, you know being sued and having to pay people if you're a shareholder your liability is only limited to your stock and as a corporation your liability is limited only to the assets of the corporation so even if you had so even if Bill Gates um, was was one of the shareholders of a corporation and it went under and owed a hundred million dollars they could not touch Bill Gates's money because they can only take the money that is owned by the corporation. It also allows for that a business doesn't have to be reorganized when any one person dies. If you own a business and you die, then you have to reorganize the business, decide who owns it after you. But a corporation allows a company to basically live forever, and shares of stock can change hands, and the corporation continues to run and exist. So here's what corporations can do. They can own property, they pay taxes, they can write contracts, they can sue people, and they can be sued in court, and they can pretty much do anything that a legal person, a regular person, can do. The benefits of the corporation is it allows for an easier type of business organization, and it also limits the risk of investors, which encourages even more investments. So when we talked about corporations, let's talk about how the big get bigger and how American industry got consolidated very quickly. There are two types of consolidation. We call this integration, where you take multiple businesses and you put them together. The first kind is vertical integration, and that is when one company owns all of the businesses that it needs for its operation, from the natural resources and materials to the transportation, through manufacturing and sales. Horizontal integration is when one company buys many different businesses that are all doing the same thing. So one corporation seeks to control more of the market share for that product. And vertical integration is where you own all the levels of production. So if you own a meat company, you would own the cattle, you would own the slaughterhouse, the railroad cars, the warehouses, the plants, and the wagons. You would try to own every single thing that you needed to run your business so that you would never have to deal with any other companies in order to basically create and sell your product. Horizontal integration is when you buy other companies that simply make and sell the same product. So as you see in the picture, this would be like if a U.S. oil company just bought up more oil companies to create one giant oil company. And these big businesses are going to change the U.S. economy because large companies are going to force out smaller competitors because basically the bigger you are, the lower prices, the lower your prices can be because of economy of scales. And so a lot of large companies ran out of business a lot of their smaller competitors to the point where kind of today you can even see the legacy of this where a few large companies dominate big parts of the American economy. Also mass production and kind of the standardization of these large companies creates the standardization of some products. If the same products are now really going to be sold all over the United States, we're going to move to a local to national economy, and to a certain extent, there's going to be now a standard of products, where wherever you go, you're going to accept kind of the same standard, the same brand names. That doesn't really exist until big business kind of is created. And as if those big businesses weren't big enough, there was also the invention of the trust and the holding company. And what a trust is, is it's a legal invention allowing for businesses to buy stock in other businesses, which means that if I own U.S. oil, I can also buy part of U.S. steel to create an even bigger company. There's also holding companies, which are companies that are set up that don't actually make anything. All those companies do is buy stock in other companies. 
So what this allows is for some businesses to buy up other businesses and create mega businesses. And by 1904, there were 308 holding companies worth over $7 billion. And if we kind of look at this, we can see the legacy of that today. If we look at to see at kind of all the different companies that Kraft owns, or Coca-Cola, or Kellogg's, or Johnson & Johnson, we can see that kind of the idea of these mega corporations is really going to come to dominate a lot of the American economy. And kind of the best example in history of vertical integration is Andrew Carnegie Steel, where Andrew Carnegie owned coal mines, he owned and he owned every single level of production to the creation of steel. Andrew Carnegie's giant U.S. steel facilities basically created kind of modern Pittsburgh as we know it today. But he was very dedicated to the idea of controlling every single aspect of his business so he would never have to negotiate with any other company or deal with any other kind of market forces. John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil championed both vertical and horizontal integration. But his horizontal integration was so successful that at one point John D. Rockefeller's company owned 90% of all of the oil that was available. And kind of to build a little bit on Standard Oil is the idea of monopoly. And a monopoly is what happens when one company controls the entire market for a product. And the fear of the monopoly is that they could charge whatever prices they wanted and exercise way too much power over large parts of the economy. The best example of monopoly in U.S. history was Standard Oil. They controlled 90% of all the oil in the United States. Because of that, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil could really set oil prices. They could also favor certain companies over others, certain railroads over others, and so the government decided that the company was too powerful, that nobody could compete against Standard Oil, and that was bad for the economy. So the U.S. broke it up, and they made monopolies illegal in the United States. They broke it up into 32 companies, some of whom you still know today, like Exxon, Mobil, Amoco, Esso, and Chevron. So when we talk about monopoly, this is the era of the monopoly. But some of these changes are going to lead, as you see, with the making of monopolies illegal, to reform movement meant to kind of stop this from happening. And here's a little political cartoon showing Standard Oil as the octopus strangling every aspect of American life. Another one of these kind of industrialists was Andrew Carnegie. And he starts out as a poor Scottish immigrant. And he's really kind of the quintessential rags to riches story. Starts as a bobbin boy, very young age, making a buck twenty a week, works his way up to high level management, eventually founds the U.S. Steel Company. He became one of the richest men in America, but he also kind of pioneered the new kind of a new idea of wealth and creates kind of a tradition of philanthropy where he gives away a lot of his money to charitable causes. He builds Carnegie Hall, multiple foundations, and he writes a book called The Gospel of Wealth. And in The Gospel of Wealth, Andrew Carnegie says that it is the responsibility of the wealthy to basically address the inequality in the United States. And Andrew Carnegie argued that the wealthy should use their extra wealth to benefit society. But he also said that money is put to best use when the wealthy themselves, with all of their business skills, actually personally oversee the good works, the philanthropy that they're doing. Kind of another example is John D. Rockefeller. He owns Standard Oil. He's the richest man in all of history, worth $663.4 billion. He was known to be incredibly ruthless in business, and he basically drove all of his competitors out of business. But at the same time, he founded two universities, and he also contributed to medical research that ended up solving a number of diseases in the 20th century. So kind of the so kind of the legacy of these guys is undecided. Are they ruthless businessmen and barons? Are they philanthropists? And and kind of the debate rages on in American history about kind of how should we think about these industrialists? But while all this wealth is being made, there's also the other half of American life. There's going to be a lot of conflict between big business and the laborers who worked in their factories. And a lot of these workers would begin for the first time to organize themselves into what are known today as labor unions. And working conditions in industrial America, not so good. They're unhealthy, they're dangerous, heavy machinery causes accidents, people lose fingers and hands, there's fumes, dust, lint, people get sick, and if you get sick, there's really nothing there for you. 
There is no safety net programs provided by the government, and the companies really aren't providing anything like that either. Wages and work hours were long, and wages were very low. And if you were unskilled labor, you had very few protections. You could be kind of thrown out for any reason. And so industrial unions began to be created as laborers in industries decided that if they got together, they could do what was known as collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is when you basically negotiate on behalf of a large group of people on the belief that you could get a better deal if you stick together and demand higher wages or whatever than if any one person tries to. But companies, not wanting to see their wages go up, not wanting to basically have to increase their cost of wages and benefits, they tried a lot of things to prevent these unions from forming. They would blacklist well-known people who were known to be union sympathizers, and they would have a very hard time getting a job after that. They would use strike breakers to basically use physical violence to break up these union meetings. There was even a lot of murders that happened of union leaders during kind of this fight to organize. And workers would go on strike. They would refuse to work in the hope of hurting businesses and forcing those businesses to basically negotiate better contracts. The Knights of Labor were formed, and so was the American Federation of Labor, arguing for things like an eight-hour workday, arguing for things like end to child labor, and also collective bargaining rights. And so this union movement, this labor movement that today, we look around, there's a lot of unions, it starts out and it's a very brutal, it's a very, very brutal kind of fight to get recognition from the business owners. And in Chicago, in 1886, there was a riot in Haymarket Square, kind of over, an, over the eight-hour workday. And there was a bomb that went off, there was a firefight, 12 people were killed, and so this kind of gives you an idea, of kind of in our own backyard, even how violent some of these kind of labor fights could get. So the early unionization movement, characterized by kind of violence, murders, riots, there was something called the Battle of Blair Mountain, where coal miners fought against like the, the army and the coal mine owners. And by 1914, most workers were not in unions, but it created the foundation for an increase in union membership and power. And by the 1930s, the New Deal will recognize the union's legal right to collectively bargain. And so today, large numbers of Americans are still part of unions, and those unions provided better working conditions and better wages for their members. But when they were just starting out, it was a very difficult struggle kind of against the industrialists of the day. Also, child labor is kind of going on during this time as well where there's not kind of a lot of laws governing businesses. And so because of this, children as young as five would end up kind of working in industry and oftentimes would become mutilated or other things like that. Eventually, there would be a movement to end child labor. But in the early days of industrialization, there weren't a whole lot of rules. And this affected kind of various groups, including children. And for the workers themselves, most of them... Most of them would end up living in slums, kind of very dirty places. They would often be poor. Poverty, kind of hunger would be kind of rampant in these places. But because wages were so low and because hours were so long, they didn't really have all that many opportunities to kind of take advantage of. So on the one hand, you have an incredible amount of wealth being created. But then on the other, you also have a large amount of poverty. And so that contrast between wealth and poverty is going to actually cause a reform movement, one that you guys are already familiar with and one that we'll talk about in the next unit.